Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, God's grace, his mercy, and his peace are yours, all because God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who are under law. Now is the time. How many people do you think said that or thought that over the last couple of days? Now is the time. This is the year that I'm finally going to lose some of those unwanted pounds. Now is the time that I'm going to use that exercise bike or that treadmill that's been sitting in my basement for the last five years. Now is the time I'm going to become healthier. Think about what I'm eating. Now is the time when I'm going to become more organized, that I'm finally going to do that estate planning. This is the time that I'm going to stick to my budget. Now is the time. There are probably a lot of people who thought those words, especially with the beginning of a new year, filled with a sense of optimism and well-intentioned resolution. Now is the time. God declared, now is the time. About 2,000 years ago, as he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to be born of the Virgin Mary. And as we hear God declare, now is the time, there might be some wonderment in our minds of why was this the time that God selected to finally fulfill that promise to send the Savior? Well, there might be some people that would look at the circumstances, the world history at that point, maybe the way that the Roman Empire had created a relatively stable environment for Jesus to be born into. There might be some people that would look at that empire and say that, well, the majority of people at least were familiar with one language, the language of Greek, and therefore the news of Jesus' birth could be maybe a little bit more easily communicated to people. Or there might be some people that would compare that time to our time and say at least at that point in time there were not all the modern means of manipulating what we see, no special effects, no digital computer animation. And so maybe there was a little bit less skepticism in what people saw. There are a lot of people that would look at those outside factors and say, yeah, this was a great time for God to fulfill his promise and send that Savior that so many people had waited for for so many years. But I'm guessing that if you ask people who lived in the many centuries leading up to Jesus' arrival, that they probably would have thought that their time was pretty good for Jesus to come to. That Adam and Eve, as they thought about the promise that God had made to them to send a Savior, at the birth of their child may have thought, finally God has fulfilled His promise and sent a Savior. But God said, no, not yet. Or maybe that man that we heard about in our first lesson, Abraham, might have thought that, man, it's going to be great when maybe my my grandchild or my great-grandchild is that fulfillment of the messianic prophecies. But God said, no, not yet. Or maybe you might think of the times of Kings David or Solomon. What many people consider the golden age of the nation of Israel, that that was the perfect time for God to fulfill his promise and said the Savior. But again, God said, no, not yet. When the time had fully come, God sent his son. Those are words that remind us of two very important things. First of all, That God sending Jesus into this world was not some random, by-chance occurrence that God gave very little thought to. Not at all. In fact, God, at the very moment that he promised to send the Savior, already had chosen when he was going to fulfill that promise. And secondly, although you and I might sit here and we might wonder why then and not at some other point, or why not later on? Finally, we have to accept that God is under absolutely no obligation to explain to us when he does what he does and his scheduling. While we might be interested in why then, 
Isn't the what so much more important? That God did exactly what he had promised to do as he sent Jesus into this world? That when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law so that we might receive the full rights of sons. Those are familiar words to you, aren't they? And it's really no wonder when you stop and think about what those words say that they're usually a part of at least one of our Christmas services. We heard them today. We heard them in the 6.30 Christmas Eve service from the children. I mean, when you stop and you think about it, isn't this really the heart of the Christmas message? That Jesus truly is worthy of weeks of celebrating his birth? And yet, so often, we might quickly pass over that very, and I use the word loosely, simple fact that Jesus was born of a woman. Because maybe it's just such a familiar part of the Christmas account. Or maybe we think of Jesus' birth of a woman kind of in nostalgic terms. We look at that birth and say, oh, to think that Jesus had to be born in a barn. Oh, to think that Jesus did not have a proper bed to lie in. Oh, it's terrible. Dear friends, the fact that Jesus was born of a woman is something that is truly amazing and is absolutely necessary for Jesus to be your Savior. You remember what God promised in that very first promise to send the Savior. The promise that he made to Adam and Eve after they fell into sin, God announced to the devil, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Where was that he supposed to come from? Where was that he who was supposed to come and crush the devil's head and rob the devil of, of taking sinners to hell? Where was that he supposed to come from? It was supposed to be an offspring of Eve. That is a human descendant of Eve. And so if Jesus is not born of a woman, I got some bad news. Jesus cannot possibly be the fulfillment of that messianic prophecy. And why is it so important that Jesus be born of a woman? It's so that he could be born under law, to redeem those under law. Now let's stop there for a moment. What is that law that every person is born under? the law of God, right? It's the requirements that God has for every single person that comes into this world. And what is it that God requires of us and every person born? Well, Jesus summarized God's requirements for being right with him with these words. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty simple, right? I mean, if you want to be right with God on your own, all you have to do is love God perfectly and love the people around you perfectly. And if you break that law of love, then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. By his birth, Jesus placed himself under that same law and that requirement of loving God and loving each other that you and I and every person are born under. And why would it be that the God of all, the creator of all, would be willing to place himself under that law of God? It's also that he could redeem those under law. You see, Jesus was born of a woman out of love for lawbreakers. He came into this world for people who have failed to obey God's law, to love God and to love the people around them perfectly. He came for people who are more concerned about themselves than about God. For people who are ready to recall the, the sins of the past and are kind of slow to forgive the sins committed against them. God came for people who are so ready to complain about what they don't have and forget about all that they have been given. 
For people who are ready to point out the faults and the failures of others, but whose arrogance and lack of humiliation blind them to their own faults and failures. God came for us. For loveless lawbreakers. To be born of a woman so that he could redeem those under the law. You see, Jesus came to set you free. To set you and me who are by nature shackled by sin and destined for an eternity in hell. How did Jesus bring about that liberation? Well, Jesus took the place of the lawbreaker. Jesus placed himself under law to redeem those who have broken that law. As a true human being born of a woman, Jesus was capable of living under that law that requires him to love God and to love the people around him perfectly. But here's the difference. As true God, Jesus could do it. Jesus did love God. And he loved the people around him perfectly. And he did so in our place. And as a true man, born of a woman, Jesus was capable of suffering the penalty of sin that is required as payment for every single person that breaks the law of God. But as true God... Jesus could suffer that penalty of hell for the sins of all people of all time, for every single lawbreaker that has ever been born. As true man, Jesus was able to live and to die in our place, to pay the price that is required for our sins and the times that we have broken that law of our God. Jesus has come to liberate and to free us. Satan can no longer claim you as one of his own. Because the shackles of sin that once bound you to the devil have been replaced by Jesus' perfection. Jesus now claims you as one of his. Because the penalty of your sin has been fully paid for by Jesus. And all of that is only possible because when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law. Now, occasionally, you hear about a person who has been released from prison after serving a rather lengthy term. And where you might expect that that person would just thoroughly enjoy finally being free, a lot of times you hear about how that freedom brings specific challenges to the person. That as they look at their freedom and they now experience it, they walk out of that prison and they realize that everything has changed around them. Their relationships with their people are no longer there. Society, places have changed, and actually their freedom results in a sense of, of just being thoroughly lost. That is one of the best things about the freedom that Christ has come into this world to win for you. The captivity of sin has not been replaced with a sense of lost where you don't know what to do and you're lost, you don't have any direction and you don't have any connection. No, just the opposite. When Jesus Christ set you free from the captivity of sin, it was immediately replaced with a connection and a relationship to God the Father and all of his blessings. Blessings that God intends to share with you because now you are a son of God. We have received the full rights of sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Do you realize what an amazing transformation that is? That God, through faith in Jesus Christ, has now called you one time a slave. He now calls you a son. You who once were held captive by sin are now declared to be a child of God. And God, your heavenly Father, is the absolutely perfect Father who intends to share with you all the blessings that are yours through that relationship that you now have with him through faith. He is that perfect loving Father who guides you perfectly through his word who gives to you only what he knows to be truly best 
for you. A God who knows exactly how and when he's going to fulfill the promise, even at the very moment that he makes that promise to you. A God who has set you free to one day share with him in the glories of his eternal home. And that relationship with God, your heavenly Father, is only possible because when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law. That you and I, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Dear friends, now is the time. I don't know how you're doing on your New Year's resolutions. Maybe you're off to a really good start. Maybe you've already put them on postponement and put them on the list for 2017. Wherever you are, I want you to be sure that God is absolutely resolute in doing what he has promised to you. <coughs> that he says that he will keep his promises, a God who is always faithful. That he will keep them in the perfect time and the perfect way. And you can be sure of it. Because your God, your Father, has loved you absolutely perfectly. To God be the glory, our Redeemer, our liberator, our savior. Amen.